This episode of Ticket Volume is brought to you by us, Invigate. Get service operations under control in no time. Get one free month of our software solution by going to try.invigate.com. Ticket Volume is welcoming an experienced trainer and consultant, the author of two books on leadership, One Team, One Dream, and The GPS of Leadership. He's also a fellow podcaster with The Teamwork Advantage. He's worked with over a thousand companies to build highly effective employee training and development strategies to build more cohesive teams. Welcome to Ticket Volume, news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host, Matt Barron, and each week I get the pleasure of speaking with different people to share their insights on service management, technology, business, and much, much more. I hope you're having a great day and a great week. I also hope that you leave a comment, connect with us, or share this podcast with someone. Get involved. Get us improving. Now, let's begin. Welcome to Ticket Volume, Greg Gregory. Why, hello, Matt. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, whatever time of day you're listening. (laughs) Yes, and thank you for taking the time to be here. I truly appreciate it. It's actually really nice to have other podcast hosts on because they're always going to have a good setup, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, for those that are watching right now, we spent a whole bunch of minutes making sure my podcast lighting and all was set. So um, I'm, I'm pretty particular about that. You're a pro, and I love it, dude. That's what it's all about is bringing your authentic self. So yeah. you've been leading and thinking and writing and and training teams for decades. Uh-huh. How do you how do you categorize leadership and chunk it up? How do you think about the various aspects of what a leader does? Well, kind of it's one of the things about a leader is they have to develop followers. My expression is if you are a leader and you don't have anybody following you, you're a lonely leader out for a lonely walk and you're not going to last very long. Yeah. So it's about getting the followers. I also remember what Dwight Eisenhower used to do. You know, he would put a piece of string on a piece on a table about 12 inches long, put it on the table, tell somebody to come up and put their finger on one end of it and tell them to push it. And it does nothing but cluster up in a ball. Then he says, stretches it back out. And he says, now pull it. And he says, watch as it follows you everywhere you go. Mm. Leadership is about developing followers. And it's about telling somebody to go to eat and having them look forward to the trip. Mm. That's what a leader is, is where people stand up and do things for you. It's where you've heard people say, I'll take a bullet for that man. Anything of those natures. Those are what we call leaders. And they don't, let's clarify this, Matt, they don't have to be in a leadership position to be a leader. Amen. Amen. (laughs) That's, that's first and foremost, everybody can be a leader. Matter of fact, I I think every team has a leader. That's not always the person who's in charge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, the best teams have leaders, they don't necessarily need to be the manager or the director. Right. 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 And when we stop to think about there's there's a big misconception about self directed teams, Mm -hmm. and that self directed teams don't have a leader. Absolutely a falsity there, please. Yeah. Understand they have a leader. That leader is just kind of guiding the rudder of that ship a little bit, if you will. Yeah. So, and the other thing I talk about, I go back to my mentor, Zig Ziglar, who used to say, a captain of a ship, the leader can only be a great captain of that ship as long as he or she is a slave to the compass. Mm -hmm. They have to know where they're guiding their ship. And that's what leaders do. Leaders have the foresight to see way out mid-range, close up, and behind them. Yeah, I love it. There's such good metaphors um, for for leadership. I love that yeah. you've got these good stories because th- this is really where it's at is, is to understand what it takes to be a leader and to fo- what it takes to follow a leader. You kind of have to understand those principles and understand like, okay, I need I need that person to focus on where we're headed so that I can focus on my job and they can help me coordinate how I affect where we're going. You're spot on. Remember this, though. We also need great leaders, but we need to make sure we have great followers. Mm -hmm. People need to know how to follow. There's all kinds of programs out there in this world on leadership. You can find them all over the Internet every day of the week. Try to find a program on followership. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) The, the, The book, How to Be a Good Follower, doesn't have a lot of sales, does it? 
No, it doesn't. And it's only found in a couple of books at the uh, master's level education where they talk about followership principles. Mm, cool. Oh, my gosh. OK, so that's the second episode. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so th there's this topic that always comes up when you start talking about leadership and and aligning to mission, vision and values like where you're going. That that term is culture. And, and I, I, th I think it's something that people are really trying, they're, they're focused on it because of all the return to work stuff. What, what do yeah. you, how do you describe culture? What is it? And what do you think um, leaders have to do with it? That's a multifaceted question. And let's see, we've got what, four days here? Yeah, it's perfect. Um, think of a Venn diagram. There are three components that make up an incredible team, teamwork, leadership and culture. Those three things in the center is that sweet spot where they all come together. Mm. So without a good team, without a good leader and without a structured culture. Now, I also believe that there's certain ground rules and here my key word here, ground rules that need to be established with any team. Now, those ground rules can be established by the leader which if it's a brand new group of people that have never met, is a pretty good way to start that. If it's a group of people who've known each other, they may not have been on the same team, but it's in an organization, then the team can help set those ground rules. Mm -hmm. Now, by them setting their ground rules, they're saying what they will and will not accept. So that line, if you take a sheet of paper, draw a line across the middle, you put down everything that's occurring on your team right now above the bar that's what's that's that's your culture right there that line's going to become your culture but for example one of the things i always tell people to ask team meetings virtual or in person or hybrid it doesn't matter do they start on time mm. well they say well most of then the answer is no they don't start on time that goes above the bar yeah now as we go through this let's learn what do we now want to put below the bar that we're not going to allow? Meetings start, must start on time. Okay. So now meetings start on time stays on top because we've that we had it down below meetings start on time. That's what we're going to allow. Late meetings would be on the bottom. We're not going to allow that. So everything there, because that's going to allow the team members to hold each other accountable. So that's yeah. going to define our culture. Now that also gets played out when you start with our new system, what's called the on purpose team system, where we tell, we want your teams to opt in. You start with four keywords for the individual, expand that out to four keywords for the um, team to work on. And that drives the culture. So we're actually driving it outwardly each level. And that's how the culture can get defined. You can get the rough draft, but you start to build the powerful team culture when the team starts to work and that's evident in teams such as the 1980 us hockey team go back and watch the movie miracle now if you haven't seen it in a while or you've never seen it sit back with a bag of popcorn and watch the movie all the way through and go wow and then go in and dissect that movie i've probably seen the first half of that movie 200 times <laughs> okay and watch how herb brooks played by um, Kurt Russell, uh, it defines that and starts to do things and build that team as a leader. Watch some of the things that he does and find out why he's doing it. It's a great illustration of things. And by the way, I've done so much training around that. I've had a woman on the team in my program whose husband used to play hockey with some of the guys who were on that team. I had another gentleman in there who used to play hockey at the University of Minnesota about that same time under her Brooks did not play on the hockey team, but he says they all said they checked in with them after the movie came out, checked in with the guys they still knew, whether it was Jimmy Craig or uh, Mike Ruzioni, and said that movie's about 95% spot on. Nice. So that's powerful. But you see the same thing in something like Remember the Titans. But now also go and watch the movies about Shackleton's expedition. So let's get away from sports and teams. Mm -hmm. And you start to see that leadership start to come together. Okay. 
um, all of those things, you start to see certain things happen mm -hmm. about how they, how they got through there. And that's what's going to drive the culture. Yeah, I really like that, that opt-in method, the OPT on purpose teams. It makes so much sense. Why not take the time to to define the culture and, and understand what we're willing to accept yeah. and what we're willing not what we're not willing to accept? Yeah. I, I could see how and by the way, not only we have to define that, we have to live by that. Mm -hmm. Within there becomes your core values. So I believe the first thing that has to be set up is our core values. And the team must live by that. Yeah. Um, I've got a friend of mine who's the CEO of a small tech company uh, near where I live in Maryland. And he's only got about 35 employees, maybe 40. And what they've done is he's got his uh, four or five core values that define his culture. And when somebody does not live up to that, and this has happened twice in the 30 years he's run this business, He's had to let them go for violating of the core values. Mm -hmm. So that takes us, if you go back, if you've studied and you looked at leadership in the past, Jim Collins' great book of what, 15 years ago, good to great. Yeah. Get the right people on the bus, get them in the right seats. But 95% of the people I talk to that have read that book cannot remember the next step. <laughs> get the right people on the bus, get them in the right seats. Well, remember that. And then they're ready to start driving their bus. Yep. Not yet. Not yet. The next step, get the wrong people off your bus. Yes. Now, just because they're the wrong people for your bus does not mean they're bad people. Their values, their core beliefs, their certain things may not fit. Mm -hmm. Now, on my podcast recently, I had the privilege to interview. He just retired from the United States Navy. His name is Vice Admiral Sean Buck. He was the superintendent for the United States Naval Academy. Now, you want to talk about leading. He's overall in charge, 4,000 midshipmen between 18 and 21. Wow. And then he's got about four to 5,000 employees ranging from uh, in their 20s to their 70s. Educators, administrators, IT, he's got everybody there. And one thing he said was with today's group coming out of high schools and colleges and younger adults is they need to know why when you share with them the why that leader will be better about creating that culture and creating that civility that's and it's interesting because i've been talking about why since way before simon Sinek ever came out with it starts with why so <laughs> yeah it's so true i i find myself uh, questioning that all the time and i, I give a presentation about il illustrating or um, visualizing work and that's one of the reasons that i I recommend it often. We do all this work and yet sometimes we just don't know why. We don't have a map to actually understand if this happens, then we achieve this goal. Or um, what if we tried working this way and you know change the map up a little bit and then the, the manager or the leader or whoever's in charge says, no, we can't do it and here's why. And that always, it's just so gratifying to feel the yeah. why. <laughs> yeah, and here's the funny part. Okay, I'm much older than you are. Just yeah. looking at you on screen, I can tell that. You probably never had your parents say to you something when you were young. It's not yours to ask who or why, just do it or die. Oh, <laughs> never. <laughs> Those were phrases. My father, I said, well, why are we doing it? It's not yours to ask who or why, just do it or die. Yes, sir. I'm that glad, I'm glad we've moved on. That table's turned. Yet guess what? There are some people who still live by that motto, even though they may not have been told that. I'm the boss. That's why I'm the father. That's why. But just because that management told us that executive team told us that we got to follow that. And I agree. There are some things that we cannot control. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they can shift from time to time. Can you think of something that happened in the last three and a half years? that we had no control over, but we had to shift with hmm. <laughs> global pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, a little pandemic -y thing, right? Yeah. So when you think about it, if you look at my logo here on the screen or come to my website, teamsrock.com, you'll see my logo is a compass rose. Mm -hmm. And it tilts 11 degrees to the west. 
Not 10, not 14, but 11. And there's a reason. When you see compass roses, 99% of the time they're pointing straight up because that's north. And that is true. That is true north. Take your phones out today. Get an app on your phone. Just have a little fun with your phone. Look at the compass setting on there. When you put the compass setting in there, you can have a button where you can switch it from true to magnetic and -hmm. watch how it changes. Okay? The magnetic, it depends where you are on the face of the earth. Magnetic north in Buffalo, New York is going to be different than Arizona, which is going to be different than Rio de Janeiro, which is going to be different than London. You can't control necessarily where you are on the earth, but you still have to really lead your team. Mm -hmm. So my compass is pointing 11 degrees to the west because I am based in Annapolis, Maryland, which, by the way, is home to the United States Naval Academy. And our magnetic heading, compass north, is 11 degrees to the west. So that keeps me on track because my mission, vision, and values are my north. Yes. That's how you get the cultures. Sorry, I rambled there. No, I love it. It, It's so true. Like, and with, uh, with the volatility and uncertainty in in the world, it's nice to have a compass at all. Um, And so it's such a good, it's another good metaphor to help people understand. We've got to understand how now here's the interesting part. You've got true which is your true north mission, vision, values. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've got your variation. Okay. Which depending where you're on the earth or in business, the pandemic or other things you cannot control. The board of directors says we got to make this change. Hey, how about this one? Mm -hmm. You were in retail for a company called bed, bath and beyond. We're changing. Yeah. Three or four years have not been good for that company. Okay changes go back and look at sprint when sprint started they were a long distance telephone company those are young enough that means it used to cost a whole lot of money to make a long distance phone call well as technology changed sprint became a wireless communication company yeah became a forceful giant and they recently merged with Mm t-mobile But when they made that initial change from landline long distance calling to mobile calling, that was a big shift and the company made that decision. And so the leaders had to lead within that because there were certain things that were different. So that's the variation you cannot control. That gives you your magnetic heading. But now guess what you get to factor in? People, projects, now forget vendors and customers. Yeah. Please don't forget to vendors and customers. If you're on a help desk, you've got you've got internal customers. You may have external customers, depending who's calling. And when you're sitting there doing all that, you've got to recognize, hey, I've got also my managers over here. I've got stakeholders over here. I've got different people in different positions. All those people have to come into play. And that's kind of the things that you can control to some level. You may control this person over here who only deals with this group. This group over here only deals with this group. So you've got a little control there. That's your deviation in your compass settings. So you got to do all this as a leader. And guess what? When you're standing on that bridge of that U.S. aircraft carrier and you've got multiple teams, you've got 5,000 men and women on that ship doing different functions. Just watch the different teams in play. Just go watch Top Gun and watch the different teams that are in play in that. Yeah, that's where you start to learn how people are going to change and adapt. Uh, You know, I I think about the sprint transition and, you know, there's thousands of people there that are just used to doing wireline technology. They're used to telecom. And now you're, you're becoming this service provider and hardware provider that is completely unique to 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 your organization Mm -hmm. and how that change had to be so difficult there i'm sure there are people that left that said i don't want to work with mobile phones like i don't want to do wireless transmission so it's about getting the right people guess where we're seeing that today hmm with chat gpt and ai exactly ai we're seeing it right there. Some people are saying, well, AI is not going to do anything. Oh, it's doing stuff. 
it's doing stuff and it's doing some good stuff, mm -hmm. but all the good stuff it's doing, there are people out there conniving, figuring out what bad stuff they can do. <laughs> it's amazing when we've got something that can be so powerful that some people figure out how to use it for so bad. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the fear it's that comes always with changing it. that way. And let's go back. Let's go back about what, a hundred and what were we in, in 2023, 130 years. There used to be a profession called a blacksmith. Yeah. That was in high demand. Today, there are still blacksmiths. Don't yep. get me wrong. But they don't take care of your cars. People who said that did not understand the change that was coming. Mm -hmm. So we got to be ready to get on. And one of my expressions is when change happens, you can either get on board or wave it goodbye. Yeah. Dude, that's so it. And, you know, the only blacksmiths I know now are YouTubers. <laughs> I've got a few friends that are really into horses and stuff of that nature. So they still have to do the shoeing. So they're still there with that. So old school. I love mm -hmm. that. So, um, you, you know, I know that you speak at conferences around the world. I, I've seen you at HDI a few times. Um, wh what do you think? Is there something unique about leading technology teams? Is there a specific perspective or personality type that needs to be accommodated for? Or what What do you find is, is unique about our industry? Here's what's interesting. The challenges that leaders face, regardless of the industry, are no totally different than any other industry. There are some nuances within that change a little bit because of who they might attract. Mm. For example, you start talking to um, a company that's in, say, real estate, and the people they're attracting to sell, they're going to have to be more, hey, outgoing, dynamic, mm -hmm. step on it like this. <laughs> but when you get inside that office and the people are taking care of writing those contracts, they also have to have a very strong mentality of how to do details. Mm-hmm. So IT is no different there. Help desks are no different. They just have to have those kind of roles slightly reversed. That's what's important. So the, the examples I like to use come from the uh, everything disk behavior models. Oh, yeah. So there's disk, which has been around forever. Everything disk was the original, which has now been modified. And the profile that I use in probably 80% of my programs really starts to give everybody a playbook and the new stuff they've just come out with in the last three to seven months. Amazing. Because Matt, now you know what you and, you and I can do. Hmm. I can jump online after we've been put into the same team. I can jump online. I can pull up your report, look at your report, and it'll give me a nine areas that I can communicate with you better. Not just your style better, but with you. Wow. That's, that's groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. And then the leader can look at everybody on the team and see where each person happens to be. So if you need something that's more technically based, now I could never be a help desk provider. Not that I don't have the customer service and the people skills. I, I can do that. I would sit there and say, have you tried to reboot? <laughs> that's about as far as I could take my technical skills. I don't understand it. Yeah. I mean, I've heard the letters IMEI. I was like, uh, it means international, <laughs> things like that. I don't know. So you need that, that balance, if you will, of different things that people can do. Mm -hmm. And today, and here's where I do think there's some difference with uh, help desks today. Because the technology has gone from somewhat narrow focused, a little bit wider, a little bit wider, where it's now like this. Yeah so spread out there is absolutely no way even with your libraries even with your knowledge centric libraries even with those i can't sit there pull out and say oh well, you can do this mm -hmm. i recently had to deal with a customer service group out of alabama but the company's based in alabama their tech support their tech support their customer service support was all based in israel now, I could not talk to them. It was all by email, which was fine. They were amazing in getting back to me with answers. I really thought they did an amazing job. 
I could see because I'm kind of at least a little advanced in communication. A lot of what they did, they copied and pasted from their library with answers. Mm. And I'm okay with that because that was answering my question yeah. still. They at least understood what I was asking. Okay. There's others that don't. Yeah. So we got to recognize that. So what happens is most organizations that are right now being really successful, they are getting sub teams within. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to the disc. Let's picture a jihadi window. Okay. Four squares, upper left square. Okay. The upper left square that you're looking at is going to be the dominance. That's somebody who's fast paced direct into the point. Upper right square would be somebody who's fast paced, but Hey, let's have fun. Yeah. Okay. Lower left square, right now, I'm sorry. Lower right square, get this, I'm doing this backwards in my brain. Lower right square would be somebody who's still kind of social high, but very slower paced. How you doing? They, they think things through. And then the lower left square then is going to be very detail oriented. So when you stop to think, are they faster paced or slower paced? Are they task based or are they social based? Mm -hmm. When you figure that out, then you know how to communicate with them. So from the service desk point of view, they get a phone call. It's easy on a phone call. It's easier in person. It can be challenging in an email. So when I send an email to somebody and I'm talking about time, I might say, Matt, how you doing? Did you have a great weekend? Hey, listen, I got a question on my XYZ part. Now I'm letting you know, I'm giving you, I'm giving you all kinds of information. Hey, he likes to talk, he likes to have fun a little bit. So yeah. now I need to address that with him as opposed to Matt, I got a problem. Here it is. Yeah. That little bit right there can help you as a tech support person do that. Now leaders can help teach that mm -hmm. leaders are teachers. That's critical. That also means that leaders have to apply that same knowledge when they're leading their team. So true. So that's kind of what makes it a little bit different. And what I love about the disc model, as opposed Myers Briggs, I think is an amazing model. It absolutely is. Uh, and I've actually recommended to a couple of my clients to use that because it's centered in here. It's about personalities and it's great for the C-suite who leads there, mm -hmm. but the common person, frontline management teams, they lead by behaviors and people will change. They will change from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. I like disc too. I, I remember one place that I worked, everyone did their assessment and then hung it up on their cube. So you yes. can see like what color they were. Oh, that's, that's, this is how I'm supposed to con con convene with you. This is how I'm going to mm -hmm. collaborate with you. Totally yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I even have people do that today with their cubes but they've also been able to put it up as their shot when they jump on a zoom screen. So they pops up there first before they turn their camera on. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm a D here's how you communicate with me better. Great tip. And when the camera thing start, they can read, okay, here's Greg. Oh, he's direct. He's to the point, but he likes to have fun. Yeah. Okay. So they know that even beforehand. Not great. I also really love your tip for sub teams, you know, like you've got 20 people on your service desk have have the ones that that are less social on the less social channels, you know, and, and taking those calls from the extrovert side and, and the walk up side. Also extroverts, let's get those people out there. And I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you one ninety nine point nine percent. The only thing I would change in there was yes, have them there, but make sure we're gradually merging them across sides mm -hmm. so that they're getting cross trained. So they understand the other side, so they don't get channel locked. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> I love that you coined a phrase right here. Now that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> channel locked. Yes. Uh, channel locked is, is, is a term that absolutely fits this industry perfectly, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. So it's been great to, to chat with you. I know that, you know, a lot, there would be more, um, I would love to go deep with you on this for hours and hours and hours. What What do you want to say to the audience? Is there something specific that you're amped about right now or something that, that you think technology leaders need to understand and be learning about? I think it's leaders in general again. And then you tweak it for the technology side. So let me ask you a question right now. I want every listener right now to think about something. Think back to when you were 10 12 years old. 
It's a rainy, cold day. You can't really play outside. Best friend comes over. You're down in the basement. You're starting to play around a little bit. You may be on a little video game here and then. You get tired of that. You do something else. And next thing you know, you're horsing around. And inevitably, some kind of physical activity starts to happen because you're pent up kids. And next thing you know, something of your mother's breaks. Mm -hmm. And you look at your best friend. Your best friend looks at you like... At that time, you hear the door from upstairs open because your mother just heard the noise. She's coming down the steps. She looks. You can see the fright in her face, the anger in her face. And she's looking at you. <sighs> I've told you before. Why not to do this? Why did you do this? And you're just sitting there. You're trying the best to bring the water to your eyes. And you're looking up at her. But, Mom, I didn't do it on purpose. Now let's jump forward to your tech team today. Are they missing deadlines? Mm. Are your customer SAT scores dropping? Are customers irate? What's going on? Are they in, is there infighting going on among the team? Are they not listening to what they used to do? Uh, are, are they being bothered by different things? So if you ask them, why did you mess up? Might they say I didn't do it on purpose? Mm -hmm. So the goal is to get your teams to function on purpose. Get them to do the things that need to be done. The top teams in the history have done just that. Whether we're talking Shackleton's Expedition, Abraham Lincoln's Cabinet, a team of misfits and rivals, okay? Any of those things. Look at every successful team you can think of, and you'll find that they have great trust, they have great responsiveness, they have powerful, incredible ownership. They all have a passion for their mission that they're on. That team has a mission that may be different than the whole organization mission, but it helps drive it. Mm -hmm. Then that branches out to the individuals. They get in sync with each other. They're engaged with each other. They're holding each other accountable. And most importantly, they start to share the knowledge. Mm -hmm. When that all starts to happen, the team functions on purpose. And it's like a budding flower. It's like a something bubbling over and the culture is developed and that team now functions on purpose and a functioning team on purpose is high performing turnover is down morale is up productivity is up oh and you know what else matt it's a fun place to work yeah exactly <laughs> that's it <laughs> so that's the power of what opt is all about i love it i think if you've been on an on purpose team you totally you can remember you know it you never forget. I've done this in my workshops. I've asked people, who's ever worked on an on-purpose team that's been functioning and doing things really, really well? And a few hands will go up. I ask them if they were the leader or the team member. I love it when I get one of each. Mm -hmm. And I sit there and say, okay, guys, here's what I want to do. I want to ask you the same series of questions. How often would you see the manager? How often did you see your team? Okay. They'd say every day. I've had some that said we'd only saw each other once a quarter because we were remote. And this was before the pandemic. Wow. Okay. They would only see each other that way. So all types of things there. Then I would sit there and say, okay, on a one to 10 scale, how much work was there? Mm. I'm getting eight to 10 scores all the time. And on a one to 10 scale, I'm getting eight, nines, tens. Mm -hmm. A lot of work. Next question. How much stress was there? I, occasionally I get a five, but most of the time I'm getting sevens, eights, nines, and tens. Yeah both manager side as well as the team member side. So there's no difference there. Yeah. And then I say on the same scale, one to 10, how much fun did you have? <laughs> I've had people pop out of there. They just start laughing. They go 12. Yeah. <laughs> and the rest of the room is like, why? Yeah. Because they were on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And that's you, what we found. You can really feel it. You can really feel it. I, I don't, I never really thought about what it felt like, but that when you say on purpose, like I know the team, I know the team mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, they know me when I see them at the grocery store, which happened last month, I was like, do you remember how good we had it? Man, we had a good. I'm glad you said that because I ran into a colleague when I was in the mortgage business, she was one of our best loan closers. 
and I ran into her in uh, either Ikea or it was like Pier 1. This was years ago. And I had gotten out of the mortgage business. And I ran into her and I said, how you been? Are you, are you still in the mortgage business? She looked at me with a shock look and said, oh, my God, no. I said, why? She said, well, I was in my 20s so I could stay up all night and party all night and go to work all day. It wasn't a problem. She says, I've gotten older. I've got kids now, so I can't exactly do that. I said, okay. And then she said this. It stopped being fun. Mm. And that's kind of why I got out. I stopped having fun. Yeah. And I got into this to create fun at work. But to create fun at work, we got to reduce stress. We got to build all these things are start to intertwine. Yeah. So take, take lessons from the people who teach stress, take yoga, understand stress reduction classes, meditation programs. I've gotten into that in the last year and a half and it's helped me so much. Mm -hmm. So think about that. That's a great note to end on and a great tip for everyone working in service. Greg, how can people connect with you and learn more? Well, if you're watching right now on screen, you've got my uh, logo up on the screen, Teams Rock. You see my logo tilted a little bit. Uh, LinkedIn is the absolute best way to find us. So click on there. You can follow us, and that's okay. Or you can connect with us. When you connect with us, it's a little deeper. You're more committed. So it's LinkedIn. For those not watching online right now, it's LinkedIn.com slash IN. Or just search out Teams, T-E-A-M-S, Rock, R-O-C-K. It's that on Facebook, it's that on Twitter, it's that on Instagram, even though I don't use Instagram a whole lot, it's there. Uh, so you can find things in that direction. Just Teams Rock, we should have the page. Our podcast is called The Teamwork Advantage. Pick that up and listen to some of those podcasts. We've interviewed some great leaders, team members. We, I've just interviewed somebody this week that's going to be coming out in a couple of weeks about what we just talked about, Matt, happiness and stress. I love it. Thanks for your time, Greg. Thanks for being on Ticket Volume. So my philosophy is simple. Do not have a good day. <laughs> a good day is for average people. Okay. Yeah. It's like getting a C on your term paper. So go make today and every day. Excellent and exceptional. I love it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for your time today. All right, man. And for our audience, did you know that you can join us for a live recording? Register today at ticketvolume.com and click on register. Thank you for listening. You can change and improve this podcast by DMing me or leaving comments. And speaking of ticket volume, did you know that this podcast is brought to you by Invigate, a fit for purpose service desk solution with integrated asset management designed to let you focus on supporting your organization without the, the overhead of a service management system with huge costs of ownership and arduous implementations. In fact, IT teams from Toyota, NASA, and McDonald's use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize IT inventory so that they can focus on delivering better service. Because good service is good business.